Hello viewers and welcome to another entry in the LOTR LCG progression series by Cardboard of the Rings, a bi-weekly podcast about the Lord of the Rings The Card Game, which is a living card game by Fantasy Flight Games. With you as always, my name is Mitch and joining me tonight is Matthew. Hi there. And today we're going to be taking a look at our fourth adventure pack in the Shadows of Mirkwood cycle, which is the Hills of Emin Wheel. So we're going to start things off by taking a look at our new hero and then gradually move on to our nine new player cards. But Matthew, why don't you go ahead and introduce us to our first new tactics hero? Sure. Uh, the hero for this adventure pack is Brand, Son of Bane, with a threat cost of 10, 2 willpower, 3 attack strength, 2 defense strength, and 3 hit points. He has the trait Dale. He also has the ranged ability. And his response reads, After Brand, Son of Bane, attacks and defeats an enemy engaged with another player, choose and ready one of that player's characters. Uh, I think right off the bat he has great stats, especially that 2 willpower, which is quite handy for um, tactics who is rather limited when it comes to willpower and questing he's obviously not a hero for solo play which i think is uh you know a given but i think he has a good ability um if your partner's deck is built to maximize the effect so if you're uh, if your partner's playing with a lot of daughters of the nimrodel gleowine gildor and glorian etc maybe some heroes that could benefit from readying i think you really could get a lot of utility out of brand so Brand, Son of Bane, is one of those cards where players tend to have some sort of polar opinion, where they're either really positive about Brand, like has been my experience uh, with Matthew here, or they're a little bit more negative. And as with Which many is my cards, experience with you. <laughs> <laughs> as with many cards, I kind of have a little more, you know, neutral, uh, a diffident opinion, I think one uh, listener put it. Something that you mentioned about Brand Son of Bane is that you liked his statistical allotment here, and I really actually don't care for his distribution of stats. I think at this point in the development of the game, people were really clamoring for a tactics hero to come into play with two willpower, just like Gimli, but the problem with this guy is he's a strong attacker and a strong quester, but at the same time, he's also got pretty deep decent defense, and a decent pool of hit points. So his stats are kind of all over the board. So unless you're taking good advantage of readying effects, you're not really using him to the utmost of his ability for what you're paying for threat-wise. His ability, of course, only is useful in a multiplayer setting, and it's only useful if he's doing that attacking role. And it's not just attacking, but it's a ranged attack. So even though he's a strong quester, you're really kind of dissuaded from using him in that capacity just because of his ability to try and get the most out of that action advantage effect. I think he's definitely useful if there are a lot of small, vulnerable targets coming off of the encounter deck. You mentioned a few different allies uh, that are useful for his ability, like Gleowine for a little bit of extra card draw. Barivor could certainly benefit from a little bit of extra card draw. You know, if you kill an enemy and then you're able to ready Barivor or Gleowine for them to trigger that effect, I think that's certainly good. Uh, I think it's definitely a little, lost a little bit of its potency since that Barivor, uh errata and overall i'm just not sure how i feel about brand son of bane right well mitch and i have played a game that is not part of the progression series where i actually built an, an entire range deck because people were sort of talking about how it wouldn't work or you know i was like well let me see if i can if i can get this to work and if my memory serves me it was actually quite good brand son of bane comboed with other ranged characters, the horseback archer or something, were, had enough attack strength to constantly kill enemies engaged with on Mitch's side of the table. Um, it just, it worked well. But I, again, you have to have two decks that are built around it. I think Brand, again, works best with a bunch of ranged characters, and then your partner or your buddy's deck needs to have a bunch of characters that would benefit from readying, because if they don't have that, then he is worthless. I think Dunedain Mark is a great card to go on him, just like it is on Legolas, to boost his attack strength so you get that ability. As far as Brand's willpower goes, um, I think it's certainly a welcome addition to have two. 
and you would be using him for as a questing character, I think, strategically. If you know, or you're at least betting, that your teammate won't have any enemies engaged within that turn, then you're free to quest with Brand, Son of Bane, with really no penalty. But if you know that your teammate does have enemies engaged with him, or they're likely to get enemies engaged with him, then you're going to hold Brand back from questing. So in a sense, I think his ability doesn't limit him to just attacking, because it's dependent on something else happening. If that doesn't happen, then you've got him being a questing character. He can do something else. I think if he had zero questing power, in my opinion, he'd probably be less useful than he is now. Yeah, I think the biggest thing with Bran, Son of Bane, is just like you pointed out, it's going to take a deliberate deck construction effort to get the utmost use out of his ability. Uh, either the other player on the table is going to have to have some sort of defender ready, because, of course, defenses are declared before attacks ever get to happen for the players, so they're going to have to absorb some sort of damage before you're able to strike back and ready some characters, but uh, maybe Brand is going to be able to ready a character for card draw, maybe do a little bit of attacking, um, but it's definitely good in conjunction with some Sentinel Defenders, be they Gondorian Spearmen or Aragorn, whatever it happens to be. And of yeah. course, just like you said, if you've got attack bolstering effects like Blade of Gondolin, uh, Dwarven Axe, or other ranged characters, Silver Load Archer, uh, Legolas, Brand is certainly a lot more appealing. Right, absolutely. I, I think my deck actually had Sentinel as well as ranged. It was both of those keywords, um, and, and it worked pretty well. Either way, um, I think I could probably discuss Bran forever. He's not a hero I include in every deck, but I definitely don't have the negative opinions of him that some others do. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see him in um, some of the upcoming videos that we make. Sure, and really the only last little thing I want to throw out for Bran, Son of Bane, is don't overlook effects like Hinamarth, Riversong, or Denethor for some end-of-the-turn scrying effects. So maybe you'll free up a defender for the following turn if, uh, you know, you didn't need a defense that round, or if it just so happens to work out perfectly. Absolutely. So we have our leadership cards up next, and it's an ally, Keen-Eyed Took, with a cost of two. One willpower, zero attack strength, zero defense strength, two hit points, and the Kenai Took is a hobbit. His response reads, after Kenai Took enters play, reveal the top card of each player's deck. And then there's also an action. Return Kenai Took to your hand to discard the top card of each player's deck. Um, first off, this card has very poor stats. Um, no attack, no defense, negligible willpower you know, negligible hit points. Um, I'm sort of baffled by this card in many ways. I was sort of really racking my brain as to why you would ever include this in a deck. I'm not sure I came up with a whole bunch of reasons, but th the thing that seemed most obvious to me is that this is an easy trigger for the Valiant Sacrifice, in case you need some card draw, the Horn of Gondor, in case you're, in case you're desperate for resources on whoever is attached to, uh, Horn of Gondor is attached to, or maybe even Prince Imrahil himself. This is a way that you can force this ability to trigger without waiting for an ally to die. But I just cannot see that many uses for this card. How about you, Mitch? Well, I definitely like that it is, just like you mentioned, sort of some on-demand readying of Prince Imrahil, so if you really need him available for his two questing, or uh, more likely his three attack or two defense, you're going to be able to pop this guy back into your hand. It is nice that when he enters play, all players in the game have a little bit of a scrying effect so they can tell what's going to be coming up next. You know... His stats are pretty pathetic, admittedly, but he's fairly on par with other leadership characters we've seen, like Guard of the Citadel. Um, of course, the downside to using his ability and popping him back up to your deck, whether you're triggering Valiant Sacrifice, Horn of Gondor, Prince Imrahil, whatever it happens to be, is you might discard some really nice cards. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're running effects like Stand and Fight or Dwarven Tomb, in a lot of cases, uh, building your discard pile isn't always a bad thing. It's almost like an extension of your hand in some cases. So uh, Kenai Took, for me, isn't necessarily an ally that I've used to great effect, but for players, that use uh, Prince Imrahil, it's certainly not one to necessarily overlook. You just definitely want to be careful of, you know, who you're pissing off when you're discarding the top cards of everyone's deck. But in any case, our second leadership card is an event called Rear Guard with a cost of one, and it is quest action, discard a leadership ally to give each hero committed to this quest plus one until the end of the phase. 
And this is definitely a card that I feel as I've kind of matured as a, you know, player of LOTR LCG now that the game's been out for almost a couple years now, I've definitely developed a more favorable opinion of this. So even though I think it really sucks to have to discard a leadership ally, the loss of something like Snowborn Scout, which immediately comes to mind as a good sacrifice for this ability, really isn't too horrible of an effect. So that's a character where it enters play, and if you're not using it for chump blocking, it's essentially garbage. Um, I like that in our games, this is probably generally anywhere between 3 to 5 willpower that you're adding to the quest. Since I generally contribute most of my characters, you maybe do one or two of yours. So it's good for a big questing push, but any uses that you've come up with for this one? Sure. <clears throat> I think that this card in many ways is very similar to Faramir, though perhaps slightly less useful in that Faramir gives plus one willpower to all characters that one player has committed to the quest. This one will do all heroes, but as you said, at least for our progression series, you and I aren't always committing all of our heroes. In fact, I usually only have one, maybe two. Um, and then I'll also agree with what you said about you know having to discard an ally. I think the two allies um, that come to mind that are perfect for discarding here are Son of Arnor or Snowborn Scout, because neither of them have willpower. They're both at zero. So they're probably not committed to the quest anyway. And again, Snowborn Scout, like you said, you've already gotten the utility out of them for adding that progress token. Um, I think they're great candidates. So I agree. I think this is a card that you would use to make a final quest push to really get through the end. Um, and it certainly could have um, great effect. Certainly. It seems like almost strange that Brand Son of Bane, instead of Prince Imrahil, came out in this adventure pack, because for almost car every card in this uh, pack, I've got under my comments section, works great with Prince Imrahil and Horn of Gondor and other uh, win character leaves play effects. So you can certainly use it as an on-demand trigger for him. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Faramir, and what I really don't like is since this is leadership, it distinctly works against Faramir, so it leaves you with one fewer character committed to the quest, it's probably worth it, whereas you're giving up the one willpower that that Snowborn Scout, Son of Arnor, whatever it happens to be, would have committed, but still, it kind of works against the spirit of that card, and within the same sphere, that's really too bad, but uh, if you need a big, colossal questing push, this is certainly another option to consider, and one that I've developed more of an appreciation for over time. So that leads us to our tactics cards, the first of which is an ally, Descendant of Thorndor, who costs four, uh, he has one willpower, two attack strength, one defense strength, and two hit points. He's both a creature and an eagle, and Descendant of Thorndor, like all eagles, cannot have restricted attachments. His response reads, after Descendant of Thorndor enters or leaves play, deal two damage to any one enemy in the staging area. Area. I think, first and foremost, Descendant of Thorndor is a fantastic candidate for sneak attack. Um, you pay the one leadership resource, you pop him in, he does two damage, he pops back out, he does two more damage to one enemy in the staging area, putting him on par with Gandalf's damage um, ability. Um, of course, this would trigger Prince Imrahil, Horn of Gondor, Valiant Sacrifice, all of those sorts of things. I think Descendant of Thorndor is absolutely one of my favorite eagles. Yes, I think this card is absolutely fantastic. Uh, it seems a little bit funny to say, since it's only two adventure packs away, but I see this as the improved Bjorning Beekeeper 2.0. So for the same cost, it's got one less hit point, but it also dives in and hits the staging area, except it's affecting two targets instead of just a big global effect. But what I really like is if you combo this with something like Thalin or Gondorian Spearman, there are countless enemies that you're able to kill outright with this. So if you're playing Journey Along the Anduin, uh, those frustrating wargs that uh, attack players and return to the staging area, they're going to be killed outright, Dol Guld or Orcs are killed, and I generally don't like to talk too much about our future expansions, but once we see our first deluxe box, Kaza Doom, there are countless two hit point enemies that Descendant of Thorndor just absolutely decimates. So it's certainly a shame that if there are no enemies sitting in the staging area, this effect has no use, but again, Prince Imrahil triggers, Horn of Gondor triggers, it's fantastic with sneak attack, you can use the Eagles are coming with it, you can use Born Aloft, and it's certainly very Radagast friendly. 
Yeah, if there's any drawback, it's that it has to be an enemy in the staging area. So if you block with Descendant of Thorndor and he dies and you, you know, and he goes to your discard pile, you can't then put the damage on the enemy that killed him, which which sort of stinks. But yeah, he's absolutely a great eagle. I think of him dive bombing enemies every time I put him into play. It's just a, such a great card. So after we've talked about Descendant of Thorndor, that leads us into a kind of peculiar card that really works with Descendant of Thorandor, and outside of that has extremely limited utility, which is Meneldor's Flight, a zero-cost tactics event which reads, action, choose an eagle ally, return that character to its owner's hand. So what's nice about this is it's obviously a free effect. Uh, you can bounce an eagle card, say Descendant of Thorandor, back to your hand. But what I don't like about this is Descendant of Thorandor is the only eagle at this point that we've really seen with some sort of enter and leaves play ability. So it's really the only useful eagle to use this on to get any sort of effect out of it. Yeah, what I don't like is that this is a more expensive version of Sneak Attack, at least when thinking of Descendant of Thorndor. Sneak Attack only costs one, but you don't have to have the ally, in this case Descendant of Thorndor, already in play. Whereas for Medeldor's Flight to work, you have to pay the four tactics resources to play the Descendant, then play the zero-cost uh, event to get the four-cost ally back. You see what I'm trying to say here. So it has uses, but I don't think it's as good as Sneak Attack. The only other thing that, that I'm aware of that could perhaps be beneficial is if you're using a card like um, Hinamarth River Song or other cards that let you look at the top of the encounter deck. So you know something's coming that you're not going to be able to cancel that's going to kill one of your eagles that you really want to keep in play. You could use Maneldor's Flight to save that eagle before that card comes off the encounter deck. Um, but I think that's a really situational thing. I'm not sure how often that would ever even really be the case. And as we always sort of say in our card reviews, would that really niche situation warrant this card being included in your deck? Um, for me, it really wouldn't. Yeah, there's certainly shadow effects. Like I'm thinking back to our A Journey to Rosgobel playthrough where it was a uh, shadow effect, deal one damage to each exhausted character. So that could certainly kill some things like Winged Guardian, and I think the big thing about Meneldor's Flight is uh, for a long time there was kind of a big argument over a uh, rules question where players were wondering, can players use Meneldor's Flight after declaring Winged Guardian from uh, uh, the Hunt for Gollum as a defender in order to spare themselves from dealing with that forced effect? Can, so can you use Meneldor's Flight action in order to circumvent having to pay one tactics resource to keep Winged Guardian on the table, otherwise it would die. And what ended up happening is Nate French came and uh, gave us a little bit of a rules clarification where the forced effects are always going to be resolved before actions. So even though at the end of each step in combat resolution players have an opportunity to use actions and play event cards, the forced effect of, say, Winged Guardian is going to happen before players would have any ability to drop Meneldor's Flight. So it seems almost silly that this card is so limited in its utility as kind of a eagle-exclusive version of Born Aloft, and outside of a few extraordinarily situational uses like you mentioned, I really think Meneldor's Flight is just... it's... it's pretty awful. Right. It also can't fetch eagle allies from the discard pile, which if it could, I think this card might be significantly better. But because it can only return an eagle ally that's already in play to your hand, again, I just, I just don't think it's worth it. So that's it for our tactics cards. Let's take a look at our spirit cards. Uh, the first of which is the Rittermark's Finest, which is an ally, has a cost of two, willpower of one, attack strength of one, Defense strength of zero and two hit points. It's a creature and it's Rohan. And its action reads exhaust and discard the Rittermark's finest to place two progress tokens on any location. Um, we just got Radagast in the last pack, which is uh, an ally, wizard ally, that collects resources to help pay for creatures. So this is the very first creature that we have that isn't an eagle um, that Radagast could help pay for. Beyond that, I think it's really sort of an upgraded version of the Snowborn Scout, except that you lose the ally when that happens, but you are gaining an extra progress token. Um, so I think this is a really good way to help you quickly explore some nasty locations. I definitely 
I want to like this card in that you can certainly use it to tremendous effect sniping locations like the Necromancer's Pass comes to mind where it's a three threat location with two progress tokens required to pass it and it's got a miserable travel effect where it's choose and discard two cards at random from your hand. Uh, I think it's nice that it's got a little bit of questing ability, a little bit of attacking ability, just like uh, other two cost uh, spirit allies we've seen. But the big problem I have with this guy is you have to exhaust and discard it. So unlike the Westfold Horsebreaker, where maybe you can have him committed to the quest, and then there's a perfect situation that arises where you uh, discard him and ready an ally, for the Rittermark's Finest, you have to basically plan on holding him back from questing. If the perfect location comes up for you to destroy, that's perfect, you can get rid of him. But otherwise, he's just probably sitting there on the table not doing anything. You can certainly use it as like a two cost event where it's just two progress tokens on any location which can certainly work out okay uh, of course it's got the added benefit of you know readying Prince Imrahil triggering Horn of Gondor giving you an option for Valiant Sacrifice it works great with effects like Stand and Fight and Dwarven Tomb um, I think one card that it does work particularly well with is Aomond, so you can commit this guy to the quest, and then later in the round, if Aomond ends up leaving play, you can go ahead and use its ability, but overall, this is a really kind of situational card. It's a pretty mediocre effect, but again, for two-cost allies, it's okay, but I just really wish it didn't have to exhaust to use its effect. There's also that treachery in the conflict at the Karak that requires a creature card to cancel it. Up until this point, we only had eagle allies, which some of which were very expensive. So this is finally another two-cost creature card that you could maybe use as a stopgap measure for that um, that particular treachery. Again, a, a knit situation, but it is another use for the Rittermark's Finest. So our second spirit card is also very location specific, which is the event Ride to Ruin, which for a cost of one is action. Discard a Rohan ally to choose a location. Place three progress tokens on that location. So if Rittermark's Finest doesn't quite do it for you for sniping dangerous locations, this is certainly a little bit more potent. It allows players, again, to circumvent uh, any sort of negative travel effect or win active effect, but it does have that cost of an ally. And I guess, what are your thoughts on this card? Well, at this point in the game, up to this adventure pack, there are three Rohan allies in the core set, and there are six total uh, Rohan allies in Shadows of Mirkwood. So maybe I lied and some of those are coming from later uh, adventure packs. But either way, there's a total of nine throughout the core set in Shadows of Mirkwood. All of the Rohan allies cost two or more, except for the Snowborn Scout. So I think that this is a great effect, but it has a high cost. You not only have to pay the one for the Ride to Ruin itself, you're paying two or more for most of the Rohan allies. So um, again, as we've said several times, up until the present day, the Rohan trait really hasn't been all that well developed, at least not in, con in comparison to the dwarfs or what Gondor will be. Um, so this might be a card that in the future sees some great use. Um, currently, in, in these two, in the core, in the Shadows of Mirkwood, I think it's somewhat limited. Yeah. Again, I'll say the perfect use for this, other than Snowborn Scout, is Aomund on demand leaves play. You can ready any number of characters. Uh, I'm sure at this point you can probably guess which hero this might be useful to ready, but other than that, Ride to Ruin is all right, but I think just like you mentioned, the price uh, is at times a little much to pay for the effect that you get. Right. So that leads us to our lore cards, the first of which is another unique ally. Uh, we just saw a unique ally in the last adventure pack for lore. In this case, it's Gildor and Glorian. A hefty cost of five, but a hefty three willpower. Two attack strength, three defense strength, three hit points. It's a Noldor ally with an action that reads, exhaust Gildor and Glorian to look at the top three cards of your deck. Switch one of those cards with the card from your hand. Then return the three cards to the top of your deck in any order. So fantastic stats. I think it's a pretty good ability. The cost is on par with Radagast or Gandalf. Um, 
he's a but even with that said he's a superior or super rather defender and quester again i don't play lore all that often i cannot recall if i've ever used this card the cost would certainly be a detriment to me even if the stats are great um, in most of our progression series we're only running one or two lore allies so this guy would take quite a bit of time to get out um, to me it's a lot like bjorn who i always sort of want to play just for the coolness factor but that cost of six similar to gildor's cost of five is hefty and if i had five resources to sort of spare i think i'd much rather play uh gandalf the trick with this guy is Definitely his stats are astronomical, like he's a superb defender, fantastic attacker even, with two, uh, he's got ridiculous defense, he's got amazing willpower, but he's so expensive, and I feel like if I get him into play, I'm definitely going to be wanting to use him for some defending. Uh, a Burning Brand is, uh, you know, an automatic must-play on Gildor if you're going to be defending, so it's a natural, strong lore character. A Burning Brand tacked onto him makes him uh, very, very resilient versus almost any number of enemies. But his ability, you know, of course, requires him to exhaust and you get to peek at those top three cards of your deck and pick just one to swap with your hand. Uh, it seems maybe a little weak at first, but what I do like about it is if a player is playing, say, Barivor. They're drawing one card per turn, they're having Barivor draw them an, an additional three cards per turn, and then on top of that, Gildor is able to peek at the next three cards, and if there's something in there that you're really, really digging for, so in a journey to Rosgabel, if it's that lure of Imladris, uh, for a journey along the Anduin, if it's that forest snare, he just really accelerates the speed at which you can peek through your deck so you've got access to up to six cards each turn even more if you're using effects like Gleowine. I think Gildor in Glorian given his massive expense and difficulty to get him into play can be absolutely fantastic so if you need him for questing defending attacking or just uh, giving you even more card advantage and making sure you've got solid gold in your hand I think you can't go wrong with Gildor in Glorian. I just know there's been more than one occasion when I've ended up discarding him to Aowen. So, be that as it may, our final lore card is Gildor's Council, which, for a cost of three, is an event, and it reads, Play during the quest phase, before characters are committed to the quest, and the action is reveal one less card from the encounter deck this phase to a minimum of two. So, this certainly has the obvious function of, in a multiplayer game, it allows you to deal with one less card from the encounter deck, but I guess I'm really curious, Matthew, what is what are your thoughts on this card? Well, I don't have too many. Um, just like our hero, Brand, this card is probably worthless in a solo game unless the quest is making you reveal more than one card. I think it's a good effect, of course, but it has a high cost. Um, the the only time that I could see this card maybe being super helpful is if, again, much like some of the other cards we've discussed today, you're trying to make that final quest push. So you're trying to really limit the number of uh, the amount of threat coming off the encounter deck. Otherwise, again, um, I, I think the cost makes this card sort of prohibitive. Yeah, I think my major problem with this one is it's nice, of course, it's one card that eliminates one card from the encounter deck. So whether it theoretically could have been an Ungoliant spawn or a Hill Troll, whatever it is, it's three resources, completely eliminates, uh, let's say in a two-player game, half of what the encounter deck is going to reveal. Unless it's something special like uh, a journey along the Anduin um, phase two something like that, where you're revealing an additional card. What I don't like about this is it's three resources worth of investment, an entire player's turn worth of resources for only negating one encounter card. And something that I really enjoy is finding some sort of attachments or something like that, where maybe they even have a cost that's more than three, but it's some sort of repeated effect. So it's not only a one-time investment, but it's something that's going to sit there on the table and continue to uh, continue to benefit you turn after turn. So just like you said, it's certainly useful for that one big questing push to finish off the scenario, but Gildor's Council, to me, is a little bit too expensive to include in my decks. So that leads us to the final card of this adventure pack, which is a neutral attachment, Song of Travel, 
cost one must attach to a hero and the attached hero gains a spirit resource icon not much to say about this particular card because we've said so much when we reviewed the very first song song uh, that gave you the leadership resource icon the song of kings uh, all of these songs are fantastic if you're not wanting to play spirit but you want to include things like um unexpected courage hasty stroke test of will all those really fantastic uh, spirit cards this lets you get around that uh, all the songs are fantastic yeah i think particularly song of travel is the song that i was really looking forward to i think particularly at this stage of the game's development spirit resources are absolutely invaluable so whether it's something like northern tracker threat reduction effects cancellation of shadow cards or win revealed effects spirit resources are almost mandatory when I'm building a deck or, you know, you and I are looking at what decks we're going to be running for a scenario. And then, of course, the natural combo with this song and really any song is going to be that Lore's Rivendell Minstrel. So this allows for resource smoothing, and I think out of all of the songs, it's probably my personal favorite. Well, with that said, we've gone ahead and taken a look at our new hero and nine new player cards. What are your final thoughts about just these cards as a whole? Any big strengths or weaknesses that spring out at you? I think for a lot of players, this was a rather underwhelming adventure pack. Whether it's the quest, which most folks aren't a huge fan of, the hero brand, which a lot of folks also aren't a huge fan of, but then the player cards themselves. I, of course, have a positive opinion of brand, um, the leadership cards are okay. Uh, Rear guard, I guess, is okay. I like Descendant of Thorndor. Um, Gildor is great, but expensive. I think if you're wondering, you know, which pack should I be picking up first? I do not think the Hills of Emin Wheel would be a pack that you want to would want to be picking up first or even early if if money is tight and you're looking for the most bang for your buck. Otherwise, that Song of Travel is fantastic. There are good cards in every adventure pack, but this one to me, seems to be the weakest entry of the four we've seen so far. Yeah, it certainly does fall a little bit flat. It's a lot of location exploration type effects, um, some rather peculiar lore cards, and even leadership in this adventure pack is a little bit strange. Maneldor's Flight in particular is really essentially a dud, unless you're just absolutely in love with a descendant of Thorindor. This adventure pack maybe falls a little bit flat, with a couple obvious exceptions. But I suppose we might as well go ahead and wrap up this video, so as always, thank you guys so much for checking out another entry in the LOTR LCG Progression series. As always, be sure to like this video or subscribe to our channel if you enjoyed the content that you saw. If you've thought of a use for any of these player cards or our new hero, Brandson of Bane, that Matthew or I happen to forget, or if you've just thought up a clever, creative use for some of these or had any good play experiences with them, be sure to let us know about that in the comments below. But with that said, I suppose we'll have to see you guys next time in our upcoming video, which is going to be our actual play experience of our new scenario, The Hills of Emin Wheel. Thanks for watching.